and onwards into chapter 10 then, what we read of that tonight is concerned with three things. Firstly, the Passover, then God's presence, and finally God's guidance. I say God's presence, that is symbolized in the cloud, and then God's guidance symbolized by the silver trumpets, and these two always go together. Now, considering the Passover feast, you know very well that there are other appointed feasts beside the Feast of Unleavened Bread, besides the Passover. There is the Feast of Weeks, the Harvest Festival of the Israelites. It's also known as the Feast of Firstfruits. There are other feasts very important uh, in commemorating the history of God's people. There's a Feast of Tabernacles, which is also known as the Feast of Booths, the Feast of Ingathering. There's the Feast of Purim, and you know that arises from the whole story of Esther and her deliverance from Haman and the deliverance of God's people in that story. There are special days which are feast days Every Sabbath is a festival to the Lord, but there's the great days of the sounding of the trumpets and the Feast of Tabernacles. There's the great day, the one day a year of atonement, a very important day in the life of the nation. There are other festivals that come later. There's the one that all our children at uh, primary school level now seem to be told about, the, the Feast of Hanukkah, or the Festival of Lights, which of course is not biblical at all. It's something that arises out of the silent period between the Old and New Testaments. It's to do with the cleansing of the temple after Antiochus Epiphanes, prophesied as the abomination of desolation in the first place, desecrated the temple. Now there are all these things. So why is this feast, the feast of Passover, so clearly in the scriptures and here, top of the list? Why is it repeatedly put there at the top? Why is it given a stress that none of the others seems to be given? Why was it something that belonged to the most critical moments of the history of God's people? Remember that it was given in its first instance on the eve of the Exodus itself, when God redeemed his people and caused them to be born a nation in the Exodus. And then when it was repeated... It's repeated here at the giving of the law and the place of the giving of the law at Sinai. What makes it so important? Now the answer to that question is found in the significance of the Passover. Or better still, the answer is found in the thing which it signifies. You know, it's always a mistake to get caught up with the symbolism and significance of the scriptures, but not see that the essence is the thing symbolized. Uh, In Glasgow, you know, there's a bus stop. Well, there's more than one bus stop, but there's one in particular that I can never forget. It's one of these abominable plastic efforts, you know, that the children take great delight in kicking the panels out of. Now, you find this bus stop at the top of High Street in Glasgow. And it says on it, Glasgow Cathedral. Now, you and I know what that means. It means get off here if you want to go to Glasgow Cathedral. Now, what kind of ass would get off the bus and say, that's a funny cathedral, a small plastic box? It's not Glasgow Cathedral. It's just as foolish in the scriptures and in the Christian life to make the mistake of confusing the symbol with the thing symbolized, with the significant thing and its significance. Do you see what I mean? The answer then is not so much in the significance of the Passover, but the thing which it signifies. The Passover was a signal. It pointed to something. Now the other appointed feasts signified important events, And they were memorials not only to those events, but to the nature of God who acted in these great times in the life of the people. The Feast of Booths, for example, where the people lived in temporary tents to remember the provision of covering during the Exodus and the 40 years wilderness journey. They are significant. They point to the nature of God who revealed himself in action. But the fundamental the most indis- 
indispensable and surely the most glorious truth about Almighty God is this, that He is a God of redeeming love, that He is a God of covenant, steadfast love, The Bible only says two things about God's being in the New Testament in this kind of direct language where it says God is light and then twice God is love. The most indispensable and wonderful truth about the nature of God is that He is a Redeemer, that He loves His people. A God who saves, a God who liberates the captive to sin, a God who lifts the sinner out of it. He is a God of grace, and that grace is atoning grace. Now this is all visible in the Passover. To the eyes of faith, there's a signal there that indicates the grace of God in redeeming love. And you find that in no other festival so clearly stated. In no other celebrated event than the Exodus is it so clearly demonstrated. God is a Redeemer. He is a loving Heavenly Father and has a purpose of ultimate salvation for His children. Because of that, you know, I find it very hard to believe that this is a reminder in the form of of a rebuke to Israel. I mean that God here, as they were about to leave Sinai, tells them off for forgetting the the Passover festival, the Passover feast. I don't think it is a criticism of them for being lax. It's more than that. It's not that they have forgotten the institution given in Exodus 12. On the contrary, it's noticeable here in the opening verses of our chapter that the people are obedient to the call of God to remember this festival. Look at chapter 9, verse 4. Moses told the people of Israel that they should keep the Passover. And then right away in the next statement, verse 5, and they kept the Passover. Now that may be almost a rare thing in the life of Israel, that she should be so instantly and readily obedient, but it's remarkable here in this chapter. No, you see, the repetition here is not to point out that the people were disobedient, but to stress the importance of the Passover and, of course, the greater importance of what it meant, of what it signified, of what it indicated and taught about the nature of God and indeed promised about what God would do in the great exodus, the exodus from sin to forgiveness from the Egypt of our captivity to the Canaan of unbroken fellowship with God in glory. Do you see? This feast demonstrates, and more than that, it celebrates the Exodus. It remembers God's plucking up of His people and His lifting out of their captivity into our redemption. Egypt and the Red Sea and the journey to the land is all about redemption. And above all, of course, at the heart of that redeeming festival is the blood of the Passover lamb. The blood of atonement. The blood of a substitute for the people as we saw last week. Do you see that it's, of course, the historical shadow that we have in Passover the shadow in the lamb of the lamb himself the shadow in its substitutionary death of the death of Christ on the cross for us and the blood of the lamb covering the doors of the people of Israel being the blood that covers us the blood that covers our sins and the atonement made was a picture of the atonement to be made eternally in the death of Jesus Christ. It's Paul who puts this in the simplest and the most direct of of language when he says, this is that. Listen. He's speaking in 1, in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 about, about the people of Israel. But he's really speaking about our boasting and asks us to leaven out, cleanse out the leaven of the whole lump. This is how he puts it. 
Cleanse out the old leaven that you may be a new lump as you really are unleavened. For Christ, he says, our Passover lamb has been sacrificed. Christ, our Passover lamb. Here is the significance of the Passover. Its significance is found in the person and in the work of Jesus Christ. Now, just as keeping the Passover and remembering what the Passover was all about was not something that the people did once, either in Egypt or here at Sinai. Just as it was something they had to do constantly, they had to keep constantly. So for us, what the death of Jesus Christ means is something we have to hold on to and remember. Wouldn't it be awful if we simply chose every time we came to the Lord's table to remember the death and resurrection of Christ there on those occasions. You see, that would be to keep Passover, but to miss its meaning and its significance. Surely that's wrong. We are to remember the reality of which the table speaks throughout and throughout all of our Christian lives. This is to be something constantly present with us. And that's what God is saying to his people there. Before you set out from Sinai, keep the Passover. Remember what this is all about. Remember you are my redeemed people. Remember you are on a journey which I travel with you. Remember what it cost. And so on our pilgrimage we are to remember the cross of Christ. Jim Philip of Holyrood Abbey, Avenue, Holyrood Abbey in Edinburgh, I beg your pardon, puts it like this. The way of the cross is the order of our march, he says. There is no other way. And that gets the essence of it. The way of the cross is the order of our march. There is no other way. Our whole pilgrimage is spent, conscious that we are cross-bearing people of God. The centrality of the feast of Passover is about the centrality of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ to our pilgrimage. You see, this is why these people who were unclean and these people also who might be exceptions were to be catered for. You find this from verse 6 onwards. Ritual defilement was to be no reason for not coming before God and receiving in the Passover, the marks of his goodness. And unpredictable circumstances were the same. Whatever happened, the people of God had to have access to this because they must remember that this was at the heart of their being, the nation of God. They were allowed to take the Passover feast one whole month later. It was for all the people, for the sojourner, and for the native Israelite. The sin, you see, was not in being ritually unclean. The sin was in having the opportunity, but not taking it. The sin was in choosing to be absent from the Passover. Now, in the simplest of language, again, you find this thought in James. I'm sure you know this verse. It's verse 17 of James chapter 4, where he says, Whoever knows what is right to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. Yes, there are people who were not to be found at Passover, but these were people who could and should have been there. The Passover is central to it all. The Passover was the point from which the people set out. And now comes God's presence and God's guidance. God's presence symbolized in the cloud. God's guidance symbolized in the silver trumpets. Perhaps you'll remember what we said right at the beginning of these uh, studies in the book of Numbers. I reminded you then that from Exodus chapter 19 right through to Numbers chapter 10, 
we have a long passage of the scriptures which deals with Israel's departure from Sinai and the next thing we find is that they have arrived on the doorstep of Canaan sitting on the hills of Moab the foothills of Judea now remembering that that is where we are now down to Numbers chapter 10 verse 10 we find the people of Israel setting out getting ready to and then setting out now here the departure from Sinai is marked and it's marked by these two things set before us it is marked by the assurance of God's presence the cloud and the assurance of God's guidance now I believe that God does not set one Christian out on his or her pilgrimage without this assurance that he is going to be present with them and that he himself will guide them now this as you very well know is not new the pillar of cloud by day and the appearance in the cloud of fire by night is nothing new by this guidance God had already brought Israel thus far by this means God had brought Israel to Sinai now he says he is going to lead them out from Sinai in the same way but there is something new here the new thing is the tabernacle of God the tent of meeting the tabernacle now becomes the focus of God's guidance and will remain the focus of God's guidance until the people arrive in the promised land you will remember that the way the people set out the way the tribes were arranged they were all set around one central thing the tabernacle you will remember that they traveled in one formation and that formation had at its heart the tabernacle. You will remember that their battle order was the same as their travel order and at the center of their battle order, the tabernacle. And at the center of the tabernacle, the ark. Therefore, what this is saying is that at the center of God's guidance is God's presence. And the two go together. The tabernacle makes sure that we understand this. Now the way God is speaking through Moses and in Moses and the way God is leading in and through the cloud are marvelous things for us. Alexander McLaren has well said, the children of Israel in the wilderness surrounded by miracle had nothing that we do not possess. Had nothing that we do not possess. He says, their guidance came by the supernatural pillar. Ours comes by the reality of which that pillar was nothing but a picture. Now, are you understanding this? I'm sure you are. That what we have in our Christian life is the presence of God as our guide. We have what the pillar of fire and the cloud by day were symbols of. We have the presence of God with us. Here in Numbers chapter 9 then, we have in token the thing that we have been given in Christ. And I mean God's abiding and God's unfailing presence with his people. The truth of our Christian lives, you know, is that we are not merely living by a standard. We are not living by a system that happens to be Christian. We are not following a philosophy of life, nor even a theology of God. We are living in relationship to a God who is present with his people. 
We don't follow guidance. We are guided because the guide is with us in the fullness of God, Father, Son, in the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is God our guide as he is God our comforter. Do you see what I'm saying? We have the reality. We are not living according to a system. We are living in relationship to our Savior. And our Savior God is present with us in the Holy Spirit. You know, not only so, but when you remember the many failings of God's people, their wanderings, the very fact that they were 40 years in the wilderness was an unnecessary result of their sinfulness. But when you remember these things and their backslidings, and we'll come to that pretty soon in Numbers, when you think of their complaints before God about Moses, but really about God himself, then is it not a marvel that God never left them? But isn't it just as marvelous that he never leaves us? Never leaves us. We say so easily, sometimes glibly, that God is greater than our sin, but do we ever begin to imagine how much greater God is than our sinfulness? How much greater his faithfulness than our betrayals. How much greater his love than our ability to ask for it. How much more generous his forgiveness than our readiness to accept it. God never left them. Even when they turned and they almost spat at God in their frustration and their anger and their bitterness. God did not leave them. And I don't suppose that I've just plucked those words out of the air, spat at God. When you think of our Savior's presence through his suffering, and yet he stuck to us. He held to us. And he held to obedience to God the Father. The presence of God was the protection of God's people. We sang in our opening psalm about God spreading his covering over the people, but that covering was a protection to them. Exodus chapter 14 puts it this way. It's quite arresting. The angel of God who went before the house of Israel, went in front of them, in other words, moved then and went behind them. And then the pillar of the cloud moved from before them and it stood behind them coming between the host of Egypt and the host of Israel. Now you see how there are more and more elements being drawn into this. God's presence is his guidance but God's presence is also his protection to his people. You know, I don't suppose the Bible even begins to record the number of times God protected his people, sometimes from external enemies and sometimes from the enemy within, protecting God's people from themselves. I don't believe for a moment that the Bible begins to record all of these, but can you and I tell how many times God has kept us safe? Safe from trouble without and trouble with him, safe from ourselves and our worst instincts and actions. God's presence not only as guide, but God's presence is here as that of a protector. We said at the beginning of this that God gave at the outset of this pilgrimage the assurance that he would be present. How many times did God say to Moses himself, Look, I am with you. In that great passage where it says that God spoke to Moses as a man spoke to his friend. Even there you find this statement again. But I will never forsake you, Moses. I am with you. Do you have that assurance? 
because I tell you with all my heart, I tell you, you're meant to. You are really not meant in the Christian life to wonder if God is going to be faithful to you. Even when you look upon your own failings and your falterings, those are no grounds for believing that God will fail you because you have failed Him. Although there is that in all of us when we fail God that makes us feel so awful that we wonder if God has another moment to spare for the likes of us. God offers this kind of guidance. The guidance not of a map, but of a person. He offers a guide, not a gazetteer. Do you see? This is maybe not the kind of guidance we would always like. And I don't know about your experience, but mine has been that often the guidance of God is quite different from what I expected. But it's always for good and always for blessing. And even if it is through a darkness, it will be for ultimate joy in the light of His presence. And I mean now our entering into His presence on that great day. Now this is most important. It's important that we see and understand that the presence of God and the guidance of God must not be separated in the Christian life. They are not to be separated. God in Jesus Christ does not give guidance. He is our guide. As he is the way itself and the truth and the life as we've just sung. Do you see that? God doesn't just lay down guidance. He guides. It sounds so simple when I say it, but it's so wonderful. He doesn't merely guide. He doesn't merely give guidance. He is our present guide. Of course, we seek guidance for our lives in His Word. Of course, we seek to live in obedience to the guidance of the precepts of His Word. Of course, we are to look for the inner testimony of God's Holy Spirit. And of course, we are to pray for leading and guidance. We can go to trusted pastors and friends and share with them But all of these things are within this profoundly simple truth that the guidance of God is not a matter of following signs but it's a matter of traveling with God. That is fantastic. But not literally. It is wonderful. Christian guidance is not following signs. It is a matter of traveling with God. At the heart, then, of guidance is the presence of God. I spoke of Moses a moment ago. When Moses knew that God would not allow him to enter the land and that someone had to take over, Moses turned to Joshua and he said to Joshua, Look, this God who has been with me all my life and this God who has been with his people through all this pilgrimage will be with you. He says that at a point in his life when God had just assured him that he was still able to be strong and of good courage. And Moses takes those words. It's Exodus 33, isn't it? And he turns to Joshua and he says the same. He says, Joshua, be strong and of good courage, for the Lord is with you. And how does the book of Joshua open? It opens with the assurance that God is with Joshua as he had been with Moses. We are often reminded of our great commission. 
the great commission being that which Christ has given to us, to his church, and to each member of his body, the church. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. Oh no, you mustn't close the book there. Go, says Jesus, go. But the last words of Matthew's gospel are these. And behold, I am with you always. Go, and I am with you. Go, and I will never leave you nor forsake you. Go, but I'm not sending you, my child. I'm going with you. Guidance and the presence of God go together. Now this is not something different that you have before you in the last few verses into chapter 10, the silver trumpets. It's the same. This is the means of guidance for the people. You'll notice that it was used in several different ways. The trumpets were used to call the people together to call the princes together, to lead the people out, to lead the people in, to tell them when to do this or to do that. And then eventually they are told when they do reach Canaan, it's to bring the people to God's remembrance. It's to be used on joyful occasions as well as in dire emergencies. And you know you can see that in the sounding of the trumpet of preaching, that it can be both a warning but should also be a source of great comfort to God's people. Now our time has gone, and I'm not going to make a great deal of this, but let me simply say it, that the trumpets speak both to the people, and you will notice the trumpets speak to God for the people. Guidance, gathering together, moving on, stopping, staying, moving on again warning, joy. On all these occasions, the trumpets were sounded. But also, as we saw in verse 10 of chapter 10, the trumpets called the people to be remembered before God. Now, it takes very little insight to see that this is speaking to us of prayer. As the trumpets so in prayer, God holds his people in remembrance. Isn't prayer about this too? Doesn't prayer lead us to God, bring us to God? Isn't prayer something that's not only for trouble but for joy? Not only for mourning but for the days of festal gladness. This tells us that there is no battle that we need to fight without God. And there are many battles And there are many different kinds of battles in the Christian life and some of the greatest conflicts go on in here. It is a praying church that knows the power of God. If I may quote Jim Phillip just once more, he says, In a praying church anything can happen. This is perhaps the greatest lesson the church has to relearn in our time. And until it, until it does, our problems will remain and multiply. That's it. What you have then in these passages before us tonight is God's presence and God's guidance. But they belong together. God's presence is the guide to God's people. God's presence in the company of a praying people. God leads, but he leads from amongst his people, a people open to him, yielded to him, given to him. God is present with his people. He is our guide. Amen.